Dr. Gurm has uh, been a, a great friend and uh, collaborator for me. Uh, he's a professor of medicine, associate chief clinical officer at Michigan Medicine. So thank you, Dr. Gurm. Well, I'll thank the organizers for inviting me, and uh, I want to thank Dr. Bunsell for that nihilistic view of AKI. So that got me thinking quite a bit, and I was wondering, um, what does the audience think? So let me pose some questions. Uh, I'll also wake up the few people who are asleep. Uh, first of all, if you were sleeping in the last hour, can you raise your hand? Okay. So uh, how many people think their neighbor was asleep in the, sometimes in the last one hour? Can we see a show of hands? Come on, let's show some honesty here. Okay. Uh, how many people here would have no problem getting 500 mLs of contrast? Can I see a show of hands? 400 mLs of contrast. Okay. $1,000, you know, if you were going to get $1,000, you're a student, and they're just a, a rent, like somebody wants you to get like, or your kid, right? Somebody called, your daughter says, there's a study at my university, I just have to get 400 mLs of contrast. They're just testing this new contrast. Would you allow your kid to do that? Right? Okay. So I think uh, the audience is not convinced just yet, Dr. Bonsall. So uh, I have uh, research funding, significant research funding from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. They've been funding our collaborative for the last 25 years. And from NIH, uh, AHRQ, uh, sorry, which is not on the slide. And then I've been a consultant to Osprey Medical. So why uh, do we care about AKI? Uh, I think one of the things that all of us should probably think about, uh, well, let me actually ask you a different question. Uh, how many of you know somebody who's had a cardiac catheterization or any kind of invasive catheterization procedure? Personally, do you know people, right? So most of us uh, either know someone, some of us might have had a cardiac catheterization or will have a cardiac catheterization if you're lucky enough to live that long. So among patients, coming through our cath labs, AKI is one of the most common complications. You see this? This is the NCDR data. You can look at many data, depending on the definition. The field of AKI is sort of fraught with the definitions that are thrown around, but it doesn't matter what definition. You pick somewhere between 5 to 7% of patients will get AKI, and a small proportion will end up on dialysis. So a very small proportion will end up on dialysis, and we'll not argue about whether it's contrast or not, but this patient's coming to the cath lab getting AKI. Among the patients who get AKI, every complication is higher. They're more likely to die, they're more likely to get readmitted, and when they get readmitted, why do they get readmitted? Most of the time they get readmitted because they have heart failure. Which sort of makes sense, your kidneys don't work, you can't maintain your volume status, you go back into heart failure, or even if you didn't have heart failure to start with, you're more likely to develop heart failure, you're more likely to bleed. You're actually more likely to bleed and thrombose. So stent thrombosis rates also go up slightly in these patients, so you're more likely to have myocardial infarctions. So what do our guidelines tell us? Um, Unlike the peripheral vascular, guidelines here are a little bit better. So first thing they tell you is assess the patient for the risk of contrast-induced kidney injury. Then patients undergoing cardiac catheterization should get hydration, especially if they're high risk. Actually, they don't talk about risk. They should say hydrate everyone. There's some logic to that, why we should do that. And then patients with chronic kidney disease, and they define that as a creatinine clearance. Uh, when these guidelines were published, they didn't realize that you're using GFR. But creatinine clearance less than 60, the volume of contrast media should be minimized. And they do recognize the level of evidence for all this is B to C. And we'll go over a little bit about that. So what is the underlying hypothesis? And the underlying hypothesis is, and I want you to think of this in a very simplistic term, the amount of tubular injury that your kidney is going to get, which is sort of what we are trying to prevent, acute kidney injury. Remember, we are not measuring acute kidney injury. What we are calling AKI is actually a change in function. So that's one of the underlying problems because it's like measuring ejection fraction to see if the patient had a myocardial infarction or not. We can't do that in cardiology. Nephrology is a little bit behind on that curve. But the number of, the amount of contrast that reaches the tubule determines the likelihood of tubular injury. Sort of makes sense, right? If you have less of a drug, you'll have less toxicity. If you have more of a drug, you have more toxicity. It's sort of the basic elementary toxicology. So if you have less number of nephrons, so you have chronic kidney disease, you get the same amount of contrast, more contrast is going to reach your kidney. If you're dehydrated, your kidney is doing its best to maintain a low GFR, the amount of filtrate that reaches the tubule is going to be lower, so the amount of contrast in the filter is going to be higher. 
Or if you inject more contrast, your kidney is going to see more contrast. So these, these basic elements sort of make, com you know, they, you follow common sense, you know, but, and they do play out in the literature. So how do you predict AKI? Because I was asked to talk about predicting AKI. Well, if you think about it, patients with chronic kidney disease, patients that are hemodynamically unstable, so if you're in shock, you have low blood pressure, again, when you are in shock, your GFR actually declines, your kidney's doing its best to shunt, uh, to reduce the amount of filtrate. And then there's something different about diabetes. So patients with diabetes, and then patients who have some tubular disorders like myeloma kidney and so on, uncommon, and then, of course, contrast dose, that will show up as a risk predictor. There are tons of risk uh, models. When Judith Kuhlman from Leiden wrote this review article, there were, I think, 11. And since this paper came out, there have been like three or four more that have come out. And what I like to do is use this model. And I'll tell you many reasons why this is the best model. The first and foremost, we described it. So, of course, a little self-advertisement is always good. But uh, the first thing is this model doesn't take into account what happens in the cath lab. Because the point of predicting is knowing beforehand which patient's at risk. Uh, it doesn't help me much if afterwards the patient's at risk or not, because then I can find out if the patient got AKI or not. Uh, so this model is sort of a little bit of early machine learning. So we run 1,000 background predictions, and then it takes a summation of that, gives you a risk of death, AKI, uh, patients' likelihood of ending up on dialysis, and even the likelihood they'll get transfusion. So this model is now available as a downloadable app. In our university, we have this embedded in an EMR. So when the patient gets a consent, we just give them the prediction that they get out of that. The main reason why I like this, beyond the fact this is my model, is that the C statistic or the discrimination is the best of all the models that are out there. So of all the models that have been developed, this model gives you the most discrimination. It's the most accurate model that exists. Um, so, now, there's one caveat to using models, and the guidelines, I don't think they thought about it, but they said, you know, hydrate everyone. Because the things that we can do right now to prevent AKI are sort of low cost, low risk. So it's not like by knowing the prediction, I'm gonna do anything different except one thing. So which is extreme contrast minimization. Uh, so hydration, or using less contrast, sort of make, com you know, that's a common sense approach, and you should consider those in everybody. But then there are patients who are at very high risk, and in these patients, it might make sense to consider extreme contrast minimization. Uh, sometimes we'll do PCI with less than 20 mL of contrast. These are stage interventions. There are some investigators who are doing PCI with no contrast. So obviously, if you're doing PCI with no contrast, you're maintaining hemodynamic stability, the likelihood of your patient getting AKI goes down considerably. Those are expensive procedures. Those are not uniformly available. And that might be where you may want to take a patient who's at high risk and consider referring them to somebody who does that. So what are the things that help you prevent AKI? Hydration, a type of contrast media, the volume of contrast media, and statins. And I'll briefly cover all of those. So hydration, there's a lot of debate on hydration. And a 25-minute talk is not enough to talk about all the data. So I'm going to give you some practical tips. Uh, we've in the state of Michigan, we have a Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan cardiovascular collaborative. Uh, we collaborate across all the hospitals in the state to develop best practices. And based on that, we've come up with a protocol. Basically, we tell patients to drink. First, we used to tell them, you, do, you can drink, but now we actually tell them to drink. One of the hospitals actually came up with a little jug that they sent to the patient and said, you have to drink this much water before you come in. So patients are encouraged to drink. We don't make them NPO for liquids. We actually tell them to drink up to two hours before the procedure time. So that, in randomized, small randomized trial, has been shown to be as effective as IV saline given in the lab. And once the patient comes in drinking what they should, then you hydrate them in the cath lab. And this is sort of the, the practical approach. You know, another way to do is tell the patient, drink one glass of water. Elderly patients who are coming from far don't like that because then they have to stop, go to the bathroom, but you've got to tell them, drink one glass of water on the hour. If your procedure is at 8, you're probably getting up at 4 in the morning, drink a glass of water, then drink another glass of water at 5, drink another glass of water at 6, and then you'll be pretty well hydrated. We tell patients who have valve disease or have active heart failure not to do that because it's sort of that way you don't put them in heart failure. Uh, there are no problems. You can assess them when they get to your lab. Uh, 
but almost everybody else will come to your lab well hydrated. Uh, the second thing is the anesthesiologists have actually simplified the guidelines for sedation. In the cardiology community, that hasn't caught on. Uh, we've not started to feed our patients. Really, what, they need to be, what we need to be worried about is fatty foods. Patients shouldn't drink milk. They shouldn't eat something fatty. But other than that, they can have even dry rice and crackers, you know, like dry, simple food. Patients are more satisfied. They don't have the hunger craving. The case gets delayed. Uh, they love this policy. So this is always a win-win. Then in the lab, the best protocol that has shown the most benefit has been the Poseidon. So they took... Uh, the Poseidon trial was done by Sam Barrar from LA. Uh, they basically measured LVEDP, well, they developed a protocol of LVDP-based hydration versus standard hydration. And what happens is when you check in EDP, then you can hydrate these patients far more aggressively than you normally would. Key caveat, the peak weight that you use is 100 kilos. So uh, our patients in Michigan are getting bigger and bigger. I suspect in Texas they're even bigger. Everything is big in Texas. Um, so you sort of set the bar at 100, so nobody gets more than 500 ml an hour. It takes a little bit of a mental leap to give patients that much fluid, but I've not seen a single patient, I've not seen a single patient go into pulmonary edema or have a problem following the Poseidon protocol. Very effective because it's based on hemodynamics and you know the data going in and uh, you can hydrate these patients very aggressively, very effective. Now, the, there's a fair amount of controversy on you know, what is the best contrast media? And the challenge in this field has been that a lot of the trials that have been done, they take low-risk patients, and then if you take low-risk patients, they don't develop AKI, and then you say these contrast media are the same. But the broad signal is that high or smaller contrast, which hopefully nobody's using anymore, has a higher risk of AKI, and then most low or smaller contrast have roughly similar risk of AKI and they're almost similar to iodixinol or visipec or uh, the iso, uh, what's the iopamidol, um, which is the uh, iodixinol or um, visipec, which is the iso smaller contrast. So that is probably the best platinum standard contrast. And there are some low or smaller contrast that have almost the same degree of safety. So for all practical purposes, you can use most low or smaller contrast. In very high-risk patients, there may be, and I'm saying this may be because the data is pretty weak, there may be some value of using iodixinol or visipec or the ISO smaller contrast. Now, the nice thing about ISO smaller contrast is it doesn't hurt that much. So if you have somebody who you, you're planning to do peripheral angiography, that's our go-to. So if we think we're going to do peripherals, then we will always use that contrast. But if you're not planning to do anything peripheral, it's all coronary, then we use uh, Iopamidol. And the reason we use Iopamidol is because we get a good deal on it. You know, but it's really not much of a difference whether you use one versus the other low or smaller contrast. Ionic contrast are, uh, I think, have been taken off the shelf. There's probably some increase in toxicity with ionic contrast. Uh, that is what we used in this study. Uh, Dr. Bonsell mentioned that. So, um, you know, I, I love the, uh, all the calculations Dr. Bonsell did. So, I'm an interventionist and I didn't really understand this part until I really got involved in this. Uh, because when you take, you know, how many of you have taken care of pediatric patients ever? Right? No one? Or has a child at home? Right? So uh, if you think about pediatric dosing, it is not the same as adult dosing. You know, children are not small adults. Rabbits are not small humans. Uh, so there's something called allosteric modeling. So what happens is you have to take, what do you dose in a small mammal? is very different than what it would be for a large mammal. So there's a factor fold increase. So to give you an idea, this five gram iodine per kilogram translates into, when we did this study, what 10% of the patients in Michigan were getting in the cath lab. So it is about more than five times your GFR contrast. So one of the questions uh, Dr. Bonsall mentioned was, why don't rats get acute kidney injuries? It turns out for their body surface area or their body mass, rats and mice have a very high GFR. So to induce GFR in a rat, you have to pretty much drown it in f contrast. So they get pulmonary edema before you can give them enough contrast that their kidney is uh, overloaded. And that's why you don't really see AKI in humans who have a normal kidney because you might lose a few nephrons, your creatinine's not gonna bump, and you will, 
not, you know, hopefully nobody's giving a liter of contrast to patients, uh, although occasionally that does happen. But you, what you see here is, as you give contrast, the dose increases, the injury, and the, as measured by creatinine on this slide, it increases. So we pretty much see that as the amount of contrast increases, the kidney injury does increase. So the second thing you see here is uh, that more contrast you give, more injury you see. You actually also see some injury to the glomeruli, or at least some inflammation, but that is like a really extreme amount of contrast. Hopefully we are not seeing that in humans, the equivalent of that. Now, we want to look at what is the practical dosing of contrast. Now, this is done backwards. First, we did the human data, then we did the animal study. So, uh, but what we want to do is, you know, this is about 60,000 patients. We just looked at what is the contrast to GF or contrast to creatinine clearance ratio. And the logic for that is almost for everything else, we, which is renally cleared, we will use creatinine clearance to dose the drug. Right? I mean, it's, you want know, to use gentamicin, you look at the creatinine clearance, and you base it based on the creatinine clearance. And for contrast, the FDA, uh, uh, the product, uh, what do you call it, you know, the, the product insert actually has no mention of what is the renal safety of these drugs. They were approved based on small studies, and there's no talk of renal toxicity or anything. It doesn't tell you what's the maximal dose of contrast to use. Uh, so what we wanted to do was look at what happens based on the ratio of contrast to creatinine clearance? What you see is two different data points. This red line is the likelihood of ending up on dialysis. So this is this scale. And this scale here is the bar graph, which is the likelihood of developing what we call contrast-induced kidney injury. You can call it acute kidney injury, measured by a creatinine bump of 0.5 or greater. So in our experience, when you have a creatinine bump of 0.5, you're really these are the patients who do worse. We've sort of stuck with that definition. Uh, we don't like the 25% change in GFR. That usually happens often in people who have a normal GFR. Your creatinine goes from 0.9 to 1. You know, not clear what that means. Those patients tend to do okay. So what we see here is there are sort of three slopes. So until about somewhere here, the risk of AKI is fairly flat. Then you see a second slope. And then once you go beyond this point, the risk goes up. It's actually pretty high once you're hitting more than five times your GFR. So based on that and some uh, statistical, uh, like pick, picking up the, uh, the best cutoffs, the best cutoffs fall very close to two and three. They don't exactly land on two and three. But they're very close to two and three, but it's much easier to use a cutoff of two times your creatinine clearance, three times your creatinine clearance, rather than 3.179. Right, so we sort of rounded up, and what we show here is that depending on whatever scenario you come in with, patients that are getting three times the GFR have a higher risk of AKI, or three times the creatinine clearance. We use creatinine clearance because that's what the FDA uses for drug dosing, that's what their guidelines are. And if you use GFR, the ratios are roughly the same uh, for three times, but not for two times it's not exactly the same, but the, the relationship is similar. So look at this group. Patients that got less than two times, there's nobody who was undergoing elective PCI who ended up on dialysis. There was still some AKI in this cohort, but nobody ended up on dialysis. And then this uh, ratio has been validated by other groups, and the cutoff of three times seems sort of easy, and it, it does um, seem to hold up in literature and other studies also. So how do you reduce contrast volume? I think the first thing is, recognizing, uh, and we've sort of made a switch from creatinine clearance to GFR because most labs, most hospitals have a uh, auto-calculated GFR, so everybody knows what the GFR is. You acknowledge the GFR, you acknowledge the thresholds, and then you provide constant feedback to uh, your staff and your faculty as to how many times you exceeded the threshold. And then in high-risk patients, uh, you can use technologies like, you know, well, tricks like using biplane, you avoid LV grams and autography, it's amazing, actually, how much work it took to get some old timers to stop doing LV grams and autography in patients with, uh, with you know, creatinine clearance or GFR less than 30, even, because that's the way they had always done things, and sometimes you just have to wait for them to retire. Um, but in, nowadays, it's very uncommon for people to be doing that. Then the other thing is now we have a new device that we've been using in intermediate and high-risk patients, and then, like I said, you know, there are people who, can, uh, who have been doing sort of IVUS and dry based PCI uh, 
The lowest I've gone is 6 ml. I always like to take at least one picture at the end of the case to make sure there's no perforation. Uh, I've never done a PCI without contrast, but I've done um, quite a few with less than 15 ml of contrast. So, you know, this is the device I was talking about, and Dr. Prasad mentioned in detail. So basically, this is a pressure valve, so it avoids the excessive amount of contrast that would go to the aorta. Uh, so when you inject contrast, some of it goes down the coronary, some of it refluxes back into the aorta. So this graph, uh, this device, it actually controls the pressure, or rather, it tracks the pressure, so it prevents the excessive contrast. So you get a good amount of contrast going down your coronaries, but it prevents the excess reflux. I think the other advantage of this is it sensitizes the cath lab staff to pay attention to what's up here, which is contrast thresholds, not exceeding the contrast threshold, worrying about acute kidney injury, recognizing these patients. And I think it has a dual impact. Having this device has changed sort of the dialogue about kidney health in the cath lab. I think that's been our experience. So I think there are two separate benefits, uh, and both I think are important. So there's a randomized trial showing that you can actually reduce the amount of contrast by about 30 to, close to 30 to 40 ml. So significant reduction in contrast, uh, which is a meaningful reduction in contrast. So briefly touching on statins. So there's some data that statins prevent AKI. The data is somewhat weak, uh, although the odds ratios in this meta-analysis are high. This is the uh, study of Rasuva statin showing a pretty dramatic reduction. For some reasons, um, which is not clear, most of the benefit is seen in people who have sort of moderate kidney dysfunction, not so much in severe kidney function, dysfunction. But my argument is if you think somebody needs a cat, they probably need a statin you know, upstream of that. So this is not uh, too difficult a choice. Now, one of the things I do want to highlight is that AKI is, you don't have to be nihilist about this. Uh, AKI is preventable. Uh, this is the state of Michigan experience. So over time, we've been talking about this. We've seen a decline in, so multiple things here, decline in the total amount of contrast that is given, the average contrast, and the risk-adjusted AKI, and the proportion of patients exceeding uh, three times GFR. So you'll still exceed that, but that has resulted in a decline in AKI rates in the state of Michigan. Um, so what are the implications of AKI? Like I said, increased mortality, increased length of stay, increased readmissions, increased cost. So in the era of bundling, uh, you will become more and more careful about AKI. Uh, the added cost of AKI is somewhere between eight to $9,000. Uh, this is looking at what would happen if we were to look at the CMS bundle. We would get, depending on the patient risk, the increased risk of AKI in a matched cohort. So a patient who gets AKI has a significantly more cost compared to a patient that did not get AKI. So one of the questions that always comes up is, is this an association is, or is this a causation? So th this is always a tough question because unlike a rabbit, we don't want to take humans and just give them contrast to see uh, is this a real AKI or not. But in tubular, in, like tubular uh, cell models in rabbits and you know, even in enough body of data to suggest that when you give contrast, you get kidney injury, but irrespective, in patients that get acute kidney injury, the risk of mortality goes up a lot. Look at these odds ratios. I don't know if you can see them from there. You know, 10, uh, sort of, what gives you an odds ratio of 10? So whether you believe in AKI or not, as a, whether you believe the contrast is causing it or not, your patient that's getting AKI, the risk of mortality goes up a lot. So this is multiple different uh, age groups, subgroups, uh, shock, no shock, every patient who gets AKI, their mortality goes up. And our exposure impact number, meaning the number of AKIs that you have to prevent to prevent one death, runs somewhere between you know, five to 10. So depending on the patient cohort, preventing AKI is probably a good thing. Um, why is that? You know, this slide is too complex, and I'm gonna make it, give you a very simple uh, thing. So very early on, like in the, 40s and 50s, before most of us in this room were born, uh, most of our parents were born, uh, but there was some data that if you take a dog, and I hate experiments in dogs, I'm a dog lover, um, so they, they did some dog experiments, they give them an AKI, and then they did skin injury, and the skin healing is impaired. 
So it's not hard to imagine, and that's been shown in multiple other studies. AKI models impair wound healing, you know, whatever kind of wound you're looking at. So you can imagine the same thing probably happening in your patient who's had a myocardial infarction. The wound doesn't heal well. Then also, we can't use the drugs that are very effective in these patients, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and uh, all these drugs that we know will improve the survival of these patients. Well, I'm running out of time, so I wanna, won't go over all the other things, bleeding and thrombosis. We can discuss that at the end. One last thing I want to point out is in Poseidon trial, when they reduced AKI, there was the added benefit that there was a reduction in MI and death. So this is not just about preventing a asymptomatic increase in creatinine. This has long-term impact on your patient's health that translates into real things. So I just want to conclude by saying preventing AKI is something that is good medicine. You're doing your patients a big favor by focusing on the kidneys. I'm really glad you have so many people who are in this audience thinking about this, or, you know, interested in learning about this issue. It's a measurable and actionable issue, and it's associated with better downstream outcomes. Thank you so much.